Good morning, church. It's so good. It's so wonderful to be able to worship with the people of God. To think about, to sing about, to speak about God's great love through his son, Jesus. There's nothing greater. Uh, Let me take that back. There is something greater. When we act on it. When we treat each other because of it. When we think about the love of God and we do well because of it. Oh, he's been so good. Uh, This morning, I'm taking a break from our Gospel According to Jesus series. I'll pick back up in January. Of course, it's Thanksgiving week, so I got a Thanksgiving sermon. Imagine that. If you turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 14, I'm going to begin there, but I'm not staying there. Mm, Amen. There's a sermon. I'm going to begin there, but I ain't staying there. Listen, Jesus went to the cross, but he didn't stay there. They put him in the grave, but he didn't stay there. Hallelujah. Ooh, we're going forward. We're moving forward. Amen. There's this phrase, there's this idea, not just the phrase itself, but the idea that I found reading the Gospels that really struck a chord in my heart that I really connected with, and I wanted to share this message with you, when he had given thanks. There are many passages in the Gospels where Jesus gives thanks to our Father God, and I see a pattern. I see a shadow, something to challenge me, and maybe this would be a challenge and an encouragement to you as well. And I'm starting there in Mark chapter 14, verse 22. And it reads, now I'm I'm reading from the New King James, so it might not match what you have exactly, but that's okay. God gave us these many translations for a blessing so we can see what it says in its fullness. But I'm going to be reading in the King James, New King James. I like the poetry of the King James, and I like the non, the, and thou of the New King James. So, Just real quick, this is irrelevant, but I'm going to tell you anyway. The preacher up here, I'm a young guy. I'm young, okay? But I love the King James Version. My wife says that I was brought into the church in the wrong era sometimes. She says that. It's like, I'd have been just fine with that old English Victorian accent and the whole, the and thou, no, no, I'm good. All right. (laughs) But I love the poetry of the King James, and so when I've been preaching lately, I've been going from the new King James just for its easy read. It says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks... He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is God's word. May the Lord God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Let me pray for us again. I'm going to pray a few times in this service. I'm not done praying. I keep God on the line always. I encourage you to do the same, that you should always be ready to pray. Paul says pray without ceasing. You know, I was praying when I was reading. I'm just asking you to join me now. Father, thank you for your words. Lord Jesus, thank you for speaking the Father's words. Holy Spirit, thank you for teaching us and guiding us into all truth through these words. I'm confident, Lord, in your ability to lead us. I'm more confident in your ability to lead me than in my own ability to follow you. That gives me peace. 
you're a stronger leader than I am a follower. So I can trust you. Help us to trust your words. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Look there in verse 23. He took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. When he had given thanks, he gave. Now I'm going to do something that I recommend no preacher do, especially young preachers. I'm going to do something throughout this sermon, and I, I hope you know that I'm keeping it within context, but I'm pulling every single one of these verses out of context when I preach them. I'm taking a chance here because I know the message God put in my heart. When he had given thanks, he gave. That's the exact opposite of what we do, isn't it? We give thanks and then we just enjoy. We give thanks and then we just take. We receive. He gave thanks and he gave. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that the, the love of God and, and the gratefulness, the faithfulness of God causes him to give as human beings we take. Listen, when we give thanks, we have a certain way of doing things. This week, many of us are going to go to family members' houses. We're going to give thanks. We're going to receive a meal. We're going to watch the game. Uncle Dave loves the Cowboys. Are they playing? Is Cowboys playing this way? Okay, they play, every, they play every Thanksgiving. That's what I thought. I had an argument with somebody about this. I thought the Cowboys played every Thanksgiving. Uncle Dave loves the Cowboys, and so we're going to watch the Cowboys. I'm going to be at my in-law's place. We're going to have turkey. We're going to have mashed potatoes. We're going to give thanks. And some of us are probably going to throw a football around in the front yard, maybe. Some of y'all are going to give thanks, and then immediately you go into Amazon.com, and you're going to start your Christmas shopping. So my wife started in October. She's ready to go this year. Many of us, we're going to give thanks, and we're going to start looking for deals online. We're going to open up the news the newspaper and look for the coupons. What, what, where are those mint Milano cookies, right? And are they 20% off? Like, there, there's going to be those things that we do when we give thanks. We have our traditions, we have our, our tendencies when we give thanks. What do you do? This week, when you're with your family, maybe, maybe you don't actually have a big Thanksgiving dinner. Maybe you just kind of get together and you guys grab a burger. I mean, who grabs a burger on Thanksgiving? Come on now. But that's all right. If that's what you do, fine. I'm not judging you. A little bit. But I'm not judging you. <laughs> but what do you do after you give thanks? What do you do? Some of us, some of us, maybe you grew up in a household. After you give thanks, you argue. Woo. Preach it. Maybe after you give thanks, maybe you start being ugly at one another. Maybe after you've given thanks, thank you, God, for these blessings. Girl, why are you wearing that? Those shoes are ugly. Talking trash. You gave thanks, and now you're talking trash to each other. What do you do after you give thanks? So this is a challenge to me. Do I give thanks and then act like a horrible person? Do I give thanks and then become selfish and self-centered? That's an easy one for me. This is, this is a... A pride issue with this preacher. A selfishness issue with this preacher. The devil comes and tries to give me exactly what I want so I'll forget about my God and my family. When you give thanks, what do you do? You see, here we find in this passage, when he had given thanks, he gave. He gave them the bread, he gave them the wine, and he gave them the gospel. He was teaching them the spiritual depths and truth of what he was going to do. Just as the bread and the wine would go into their bodies and sustain their life for another day, he was going to give his body, his blood, that they might be sustained for an eternity. When he had given thanks to the Father, he gave life to his disciples. Amen? Amen. We find in another passage, you remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? Could you imagine? Could you imagine? We're going out by the, by the lake. We're going to be kind of out in the wilderness. We're away from people. This little boy's like, I'm going to pack a sack lunch. I got some loaves of bread. I got a couple fish. I'll be good to go. That's enough for me. Well, if you only knew he was going to meet Jesus that day. 
if that little boy only knew what was going to happen with his sack lunch. Jesus, when he fed the 5,000 there in John chapter 6, verse 11, it says, Jesus took the loaves from this little boy's lunch, and when he had given thanks, when he had given thanks, he distributed them to his disciples. And the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. See, when Jesus had given thanks, he distributed. He didn't just give. See, here's the thing. We talk about God gives and we forget. God doesn't just give. God gives. Press them. Shaken together. And running over. Like when God gives, God gives more abundantly, exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine. That when God gives, he doesn't just give, he distributes. When God gives, he doesn't just add something to you, he multiplies. My God is into equations that have exponential zeros. I'm talking about zeros upon zeros upon zeros. Have you seen the stars at night? When he distributes, he distributes wide. He distributes farther than you can think. He took a word. He took a word and created all the light. Light be. Like in the English, we read Genesis chapter 1. We read, let there be light. Well, that's because English is a funny language. In the Hebrew, it's just two little words. Light be. And it was. And it was. When God distributes he multiplies. He goes farther than you can imagine. When Jesus had given thanks, he distributed the bread to the disciples, and then they distributed to the people as much as they wanted. There was so much left over that there were 12 baskets full. When Jesus had given thanks, he distributed. When people get you, what do they get? Like, are people thankful when you show up? You know, the only thing that doesn't add anything to you when it shows up is a zero. I'm preaching better than you think I am. Are you a zero? Do you add nothing to the equation of your house, your family, your friends, your company, your school, your neighborhood? Or do you multiply? Do you add something? Does your life distribute something to the equation? Or do you just give thanks and take, take, take from everywhere you go? I told you it was going to be a challenge. This challenges me. Are people grateful when you show up? Listen, I might not be able to fulfill this 100% of the time, but I have this desire in my heart. I want people to be glad when I show up. I want people to be like, this guy's here. He's going to add something to it. He's got something to bring to the mix to add to it. He's going to distribute something of his gift, of his character, of his sweat, of his strength. You ever been moving furniture and your buddy shows up and then he sits on the couch and puts his feet up? Are you thankful that he's there? <laughs> he took the loaves, and when he'd given thanks, he distributed. He gave, and he didn't just give. He distributed. He multiplied. We got to be the kind of people that add something to our community. We can't just be singing hymns. Oh, God is so great. But then not give and love and serve in our community. How can people believe our testimony? We say we love God. But if we don't love the people we can see in our own neighborhood, how can we say we love God? If you can't love people you can see, how can you claim to love God whom you cannot see? Amen. Remember when Jesus, I got this, I got this saying in my head. Remember when... Remember when, because when we go to Thanksgiving, it's always remember when last Thanksgiving or remember that last time. Every time we get together as a family, we talk about times we were together as a family. Anybody else's family do that? Will you tell old stories and then eventually grandpa gets to the age where he tells the same story every year? 
And some people get bored. I didn't. I loved it that grandpa would tell the same stories. Like, we would never stop and be like, Grandpa, we heard that one before. We would just, with bated breath, what detail is he going to add to the story this time <laughs> that we didn't get last time? Like, and then by the time you get to 30 years old, the story has changed so much, and you know the real truth. Who? talking to somebody. Can you tell I'm excited? I'm, I, listen. I'm trying to get with it in this pulpit. I want to preach the way I want to be preached to, so that's why I preach this way. Somebody get excited. Get excited about Jesus. It's like, is the preacher excited about the message? Because if he ain't, I can't. Remember when, remember when Jesus gave authority to his disciples to cast out demons? You remember that? You remember? I give you power over, over snakes and scorpions and all the power of the enemy. He gives them power to cast out demons. And then they come back rejoicing that they could, they could cast out demons. The devils obeyed their words. It says, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced. Whew. What a wonderful thing to be said. The disciples in this passage in Luke chapter 10, the disciples are rejoicing. You're in the right place when you rejoice and Jesus rejoices with you. Hallelujah. That's why I like baptizing people. Because the scripture says that when a person comes to faith, a person gets baptized, that the angels in heaven are rejoicing. If the angels in heaven are rejoicing, I'm thinking the Lord's probably rejoicing right along with him. He's leading the band. You, look, Jesus is a good example. So if the angels are all rejoicing, what do you think the Lord is doing? He's conducting the whole orchestra. Yeah, exactly, brother. So if the angels are rejoicing, you know the Lord's rejoicing. Whew. What does the prophet say? The Lord rejoices over you with singing. You know the Lord sings over you. Yeah. Whew. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father. Look at Jesus giving thanks to the Father. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the, Father, who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son. And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Has the Father God been revealed to you through Jesus Christ the Son? Do you know God better? Do you understand who God is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ? What a blessing to be counted in this number. You know, God's only been revealed to you because the Son wills to reveal him to you. So you got something right there to be thankful for. Like, God has shown me who he is. I believe the gospel. I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. you got to be thankful. That wasn't something you did. You know, sometimes we do that. We do that like, well, I believe in God like it's something you did. Well, I got faith in the Lord. You know, faith is a gift. The scripture says faith is a gift. It's been given to you. So why do we boast about something given to us as though it wasn't given to us? We boast as though it's something we came up with ourselves. You didn't write this story. You didn't come up with this stuff. You didn't make your own heart. God put you in the place that you were in to cause you to come to faith. And you ought to give thanks. Hmm. You are one to whom the Son has willed to reveal himself. So be thankful. Because there are other people in the dark. There are other people who are blind. Be thankful that God has revealed himself to you. He turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard. He was thanking the Father, and he turns to his disciples, and he says, Blessed are the eyes which see. When Jesus had given thanks... He blessed. He blessed. Now, if you're anything like my house was when I was growing up, after we'd given thanks, there was a lot of cursing going on. 
especially at the TV and them cowboys. Ever notice that? The boys are throwing a ball around playing a game. Why cussing at the TV? They can't even hear you exactly. You look like a fool. I have looked like a fool. I'm not counting myself out. I used to be one of those guys, slamming my drink and hollering at the TV. What you doing that for? When you've given thanks, do you curse? And I don't just mean saying four-letter words because there's an awful lot of curses that are spoken with flowery language. (laughs) Oh, you've heard them before. That boy's just like his daddy. Ooh. Ooh. You ever known a woman that hated the boy's daddy because she was no longer with the boy's daddy? And then she had to say, that boy's just like his daddy. She didn't mean it in a good way. You know, that boy is just like his daddy. There's not a single curse word in there, but that whole saying, that whole sentence with the toxicity and the poison of the tongue, that sentence was a curse. See, we, we got to get out of this mentality where it's just like, well, if you, as long as you don't say these words, you're not cursing. That's elementary. That's elementary to think it's just certain words or curse words. It's how you say it. It's what you intend. Why do you say what you say? If you say what you say to hurt somebody, if you say what you say to bring somebody down, best believe you're cursing. And somebody need to wash your mouth out with soap. Anybody ever have a house like that where grandma or mom wash your mouth out with soap? I see them hands going up. Yes. Yes. I, you know, I don't know what happened. What happened? Kids have so much power these days. Did you notice that? They got so much power these days. I'll be standing in the grocery store watching a kid act up, and I'm just waiting for him to get punted across the room. And it never happens. I'm like, wow, this boy got away with all that in public? (laughs) Something has happened to our society. We just let kids do whatever they want. Say whatever they want. They're just grabbing stuff off the shelves, throwing it in the basket. But I dare you, if you was with my mother, I dare you to grab something that wasn't on her list. You would, you would get a slipper upside the head. <laughs> Put it back. We ain't here for that. And then the, the awful temptation of Satan himself. You are this tall, and that's exactly where they put the Skittles. Right at eye level. It's right at eye level. And you a little kid trying to be holy and pure, looking at them Skittles like, "Mm, mm, God, give me strength. Whack! Get that slipper to the back of the head. Don't touch them. You don't need no candy. I'll pray for you, brother. I'll pray for you. When you give thanks, do you bless? (laughs) I know. Hey, listen. I'm going to take these rabbit trails, go off the rails. It's all right. Your your preacher's crazy. I've seen a lot of stuff. (sighs) I love what he says. Blessed are your eyes. See, there are some things I've seen maybe you haven't seen. And there are some of you that are saying, I've seen the exact same stuff, preacher. I know you're talking about my childhood. He says to his disciples, look, blessed are your eyes, the things that you've seen. Prophets and kings, they desired to see it, they didn't see it. They wanted to hear it, they didn't hear it. Do you know that there is a secret place? There is a secret place near to the heart of God. There's a place where God will bless you and he will show you things that other people wish they could see. There's a secret place in this life, in this reality. There's a secret place where God will let you hear things that other people wish they could hear. It comes through knowing him. It comes through tears, hard tears, on bended knee at the side of your bed at one o'clock in the morning praying for your baby. God, please, 
please help us. There is a secret place. We call it the secret place of the Most High where he will reveal to you his love, his grace, his pleasure. Listen, there's a secret place in my house with my wife. There are some things that she gets to see that nobody else gets to see. There's a secret place. And see, for you young people, there's a secret place for your parents. I'm just going to keep it as PG as I can. There are some things your dad says to your mom that he don't say to nobody else. Now, I'm not trying to be filthy, dirty, or anything like that. I'm just trying to make a point. When you are intimately, romantically, lovingly involved personally with someone and you are linked to them in marriage, you've been joined together to them in God's holy matrimony, there are some secret things that that romantic, loving couple share. Do you know the scripture says that that Christ is our bridegroom? That we have been married to him. We have been united to him. And there are some secret, intimate, loving, romantic things that God wants to reveal to you. This is why it's a good idea to go into your room when you pray and shut the door. Go in the closet, Jesus says, and shut the door. There's an intimate place of worship and prayer and thankfulness with you and the Lord. You ever have somebody in your family that just knew things that they couldn't know? Have you ever had an aunt or a grandma say something to you that she could not have possibly known? Said something that made your heart go, ooh, how did mom, how did mom know? How did grandma know to say that? Baby, she was in the intimate place. She was in the secret place with the Lord, and the Lord revealed that secret to her. That's why she said it to you. There's some of you looking at me like you have no idea what I'm talking about. That's okay. That's okay. God's grace is for you as well. How is it? How is it that a man that don't know me from Adam could stand at a pulpit and say something that would pierce my heart? Let me tell you a little secret. I ain't that smart. I'm kind of a fool. My wife's looking at me like she's trying not to say nothing. Just be quiet. Keep looking straight ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'm kind of a fool. But the Lord uses the foolish things of this world. I know my heart. I know my mind. I know what kind of man I am. And when I have people come to me and say, Preacher, you said exactly what I needed to hear. I'm thinking to myself, well, praise the Lord, because I have no idea. And then someone will say, you know that part in your sermon where you said this, that, and the other? And I'm looking, that wasn't in my notes. And I'm, I want to take my shoes off. When that happens, I want to take my shoes off, because I'm like, ooh, you standing in a holy place, brother. You better, you better act right. You better get your stuff together. It's a challenge trying to do this. God. God has given this example. When he'd given thanks, Jesus had given thanks, he blessed. And from the secret place, he blessed. Let me move on. Remember when Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead? Remember Lazarus was sick? Remember? (laughs) Be thankful in everything. Are you thankful when the Lord waits Two more weeks? Like, you need the blessing now, and he stays where he's at for two days, four days. You know, when they told him Lazarus was sick, the scripture says he stayed where he was for two more days. By the time he got to Lazarus, he'd been dead for four days. Think about that. Have you ever been calling on the Lord You ever been calling on the Lord? Lord, we need your help now. And two days go by, and two weeks go by, and then two months go by. You're still crying out, Lord, I need you. And then then two years go by. Too long goes by. (laughs) 
What if it's not about you? What if it's not about me? The scripture says, the scripture says that Jesus did what he did so that way the people would believe on him. Listen to what he says. He told them to take the stone away. They took the stone away. They took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. It wasn't about them. They needed to believe that God sent Jesus. People believing that God sent Jesus is more important than your individual problems being solved. People believing on Jesus being sent from the Father is more important than your patience being tested. It's more important than you being blessed. It's more important than you having it your way. This is not, I repeat, this is not Burger King. You cannot have it your way. Jesus said he said these things, he prayed these things because of the people who were standing by that they may believe that you sent me. People have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to get saved. It is more important that people believe on the Lord Jesus Christ than you having everything you ask the Lord for. See, if he would have came sooner, if he would have came sooner, Lazarus, he could have healed him. He could have still healed him, but he'd healed so many sick people. He wasn't just going to heal Lazarus' sickness. He's going to raise him from the dead. How spectacular is that? How impossible is that? I mean, if he'd have healed him, some people could have said, well, he'd have gotten better anyway. But if the man's been dead for four days and his sister is saying, Lord, he stinks. That, listen, he's been dead for four days and he stinks. The, the King James, he stinketh. He stinketh. That's how dead he is. When he raises Lazarus from the dead, the scripture says people began to believe on him. He did the impossible. When he had said these things, when he had given thanks to the father, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who died, who had died, came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. His face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. When he had given thanks, he did the impossible. When he had given thanks, he did the impossible. You see, the Lord is looking for some grateful people, some thankful people, because the Lord wants to do some impossible things. You know, you know what the impossible things are that the Lord wants to do in your life? He wants to raise people from the dead. The scripture says he's going to raise people from the dead on the last day. And did you know that he's given you the opportunity to participate in this impossible task? You know how these people are going to get raised from the dead on the last day? Is if they hear the gospel and believe it. And guess what your job is? Guess what my job is? We're supposed to carry this gospel to the four corners of the earth. We're supposed to tell people about Jesus. Love people with the love of Jesus. And be thankful, grateful people that after we've given thanks, we do the impossible by God's power, by God's will, by sharing this gospel and getting people saved. You know it's impossible for people to get saved? Jesus said so. Peter says, who then, Lord, can be saved? Jesus' answer was, with men... This is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It is impossible for us to save people. But with the help of God, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, people can get saved. God wants to do the impossible in the church. When Jesus had given thanks, he did the impossible. He raised the dead. And Jesus said, those who believe on me, the works that I do shall they do also. And greater works. Jesus did the impossible. And Jesus says, if you believe on him, you'll do greater works than these. Whew. Whew. Isn't he good? 
After you've given thanks, what do you do? Do you build people up? After you've given thanks, do you give, do you serve? There's a passage, like I said, I'm pulling stuff out of context, but I'm trying to make a point here. In 1 Corinthians 14, the Apostle Paul says, Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the unformed say amen at your giving of thanks? Since he does not understand what you say. For indeed, for you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Now think about this. The context is Paul's talking about speaking in tongues. And he's talking about speaking in plain speech and prophecy. And he says, you who speak in tongues and you give thanks in tongues, you might be given thanks well. But if the people standing by don't understand what you're saying, how can they be built up? You see the point he's making? It's not really just about tongues or, or the way you pray or the way you say thanks. Is the way your thankfulness is expressed, does it lead to people being edified? Or are we just giving thanks so we can feel spiritual? You know, I gave thanks to God. I did my devotional this morning. I got it going on in Jesus' name. I'm Mr. Suchy Much. What? What about the other people standing by? Do you take care of your family? Do you take care of your neighbors? Do you love people? Do you serve people? You indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. What good does it do for us to sing some songs, for me to beat on those drums and have a great time praising God if we don't leave this place and actually love people? We might praise well, but then the other is not built up and edified. What good do all our programs and preaching and praise and worship do if we're not building up the kingdom of God? Whew. What good does it do to be spiritual and give thanks if you aren't building up God's kingdom? Mm. Look what Paul commands us in his letter to the Thessalonians. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. Comfort, comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything. In everything. Turn to your neighbor. Tell him, in everything. And then turn to your other neighbor. Tell him, in everything. In everything. Give thanks. Give thanks in your heart. It's fine to give thanks in the spirit. Start there. Give thanks in your heart. But don't let it stop there. Give thanks in the way you live. Be thankful by giving to others. Be thankful by being generous. Give thanks by loving and serving others in Jesus' name. Give thanks Ooh, by speaking the name of Jesus in love to others in everything you do, not just in your heart, not just in your prayer, not just in your praise songs, but what you do with your hands, where your feet take you, what you say with your mouth. Be a thankful, grateful person who demonstrates the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Everything and everything and everything reminds me of another verse. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. One of the ways you can be thankful is by praising the Lord. Notice, notice that, he, that he, he makes this qualifier of who should praise the Lord. Because there are some people that's just, you sit, you're stone-faced, you don't get excited about God, you never smile, you're not happy about the Lord. Oh, I'm a Christian, I got the love of Jesus in my heart, but you look like you've been sucking on a lemon. <laughs> Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Well, I don't do that. Those Pentecostals down the street. He didn't say if they're a Pentecostal. He didn't care if you're rich. He didn't care if you're poor. He didn't care if you're black. He doesn't care if you're white. He doesn't care if you're Latino. He don't care if you're dressed well. He doesn't care if you're dressed badly. You got shorts on. You got slacks on. The only qualifier is are you breathing? <laughs> then praise the Lord. Do you have breath? Praise the Lord. And he says it again. 
Praise the Lord. Praising the Lord, giving thanks to his name is the praise, the sacrifice of praise that is required of us. I'll end with this passage from Hebrews 13. Look at this. Therefore, by him, let us continually, continually, not just Thursday, not just Sunday morning, not just because it's a holiday, but let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, he explains what he means. The sacrifice of praise to God is this, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. If you got breath, this is for you. You still breathing? Offer the sacrifice of praise. Use your lips. Use your mouth. Give thanks. Say thank you. When was the last time you just said, Lord, thank you? I don't know for what, but thank you. I can't remember all my blessings, but thank you. I'm trying to count them, but my calculator don't go that high. Thank you, Lord. You've blessed me so much. I was bad at math. I can't keep track, but thank you. Thank you, Lord. And listen to this. But do not forget to do good. And to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. You want to be pleasing to the Lord? You want to, be, you want to cause God to be well pleased? The apostle says, do good and share. Do good and share. You ready? That was the pep talk. That was the... Go team, go from the coach. You're the team. I know some of y'all are looking forward to the game on Thursday, but the game starts right now. We are on the team of Jesus. That's what Lloyd would say. We team Jesus, right? And that's what Lloyd would say. Team Jesus. Ready? Break. Let's go to our places. Let's go to our homes and be thankful, doing good and sharing. Let's go to our work. Being thankful, doing good, and sharing. Let's go to our schools. Let's go to the people in this community. Let's be thankful. Let's offer the sacrifice of praise to God and then do good and share. Prove his will. Show people that Jesus is alive in you. In you, in you, in you. You ready, team? You ready, team? If you're ready, stand up on your feet. If you're ready, stand up on your feet. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this people. I thank you for this church that loves you, that praises you well, that gives thanks to you well. Lord, give us the strength, the boldness, the wisdom to do good and to share. Give us the insight that we need to put ourselves in places where we can be a blessing. Lord, make us a people that add to others. Make us a people that distribute and multiply the blessings and give so much away that we have leftovers. Make us a people I just follow you in giving your whole life. You gave and you gave. You gave healing. You gave food. You gave wisdom. You gave truth. You gave love. And you gave your very last drop of blood. All of your life was a gift. Make us a gift. This Thanksgiving, make us thankful people, givers. Make us givers. Make us generous because there are people we are surrounded by that need something from you, Lord. They need a blessing from you. And they're not going to get it unless your church obeys you. We need to humble ourselves, Lord. Thank you for this challenge. Thank you for this message. You've done so much, Lord. You've done so much, Lord. We count our blessings and there are too many to count. Let us be a people that do good works. Knowing that we're already saved. You already love us. You've already given salvation to us. But that we do good works. That others might be blessed. And that others might give thanks to your name as well. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Jesus wants to do the impossible. Everybody this week. You're going to meet somebody. There's going to be somebody 
They might be in your family. It might be your cousin. It might be your, your second brother's uncle's sister's stepdaughter's boyfriend. It's going to be somebody. And you don't need to preach at them. You don't, need to, you don't need to point out their sin. You just need to do good and share. Love them. Love them. Even now, I believe there might be some people, you're getting an idea right now what you can do. Somebody here thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to send a card to that lady because I haven't talked to her in a while. I'm going to send her a card. And I'm going to encourage her in the Lord. I believe that's a work of the Lord. I believe that God can use that seed to be a blessing. Some here, you, there's a young person here that you might be thinking, I'm going to build a hospital. God can do the impossible. You know, God can move a mountain with a word. You think he can't build a hospital with a couple hands and feet? If he could do it with a word, imagine what he would do if you would just yield yourself to him. Imagine what he would build. There's all kinds of stuff happening in this room. I believe it with all my heart. There's all kinds of works that God has prepared before the foundation of the world. And all the arsenal, the army, the supply, the resources of heaven are on standby waiting for you to just humble yourself and obey. God's ready to move in your life. Are you going to believe him? Let's do the work. Let's be the hands and feet. If there's anybody here that has not surrendered their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I invite you to come as we sing. We're going to sing a song. We're going to talk about counting our blessings. If you need to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I invite you to come as we sing. If you have not been baptized in water, fully immersed in water into the Lord Jesus Christ, the water is ready. You can get baptized today. If you need to get baptized in the Lord Jesus, you've never been baptized, I invite you to come. I invite you to come. Come as we sing.